Candyman, a murderous soul with a hook for a hand, is accidentally summoned to reality by a skeptic student researching the monster's myth. Candyman is up next on Inside Movies. Hey guys, uh, welcome to Inside Movies with George McHale and friends. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, GMB uh, Komichuk, uh, writer, illustrator, awesome dude. He's away camping, but he's making time for Inside Movies. Uh, I got uh, novelist Andrew Buckley, and today we're joined for the first time uh, by John Danger Delaney from uh, Adventures of the DC Universe and uh, uh, Simpsons, Futurama, and, uh, and he's a director who's worked on shows like uh, Voltron Force. So uh, thanks for being on the show, guys. Right thanks on. for having us, George. Woo. Awesome. Uh, before we get into Candyman, which I'm super excited about, um, let's talk about uh, a special project uh, called The Eye Collector. From uh, yes, can you That's tell us a little bit about what your new book is? Oh, there it oh is. the Eye Collector is a horror graphic novel uh, out from Heavy Metal right now, um, by co-created by myself and Dr. Jonathan Ball. And it is a very scary story about parents that have made a deal with a creature that visits their house at night. In exchange for their child's eyes, they're going to get everything they've ever wished for. Wow. That sounds creepy. It's pretty creepy. I would would, would do that deal. I would take that deal. (laughs) (laughs) I would take that deal. I have a pretty long list of things I've ever wished for. I ain't no my kid. He uh, he doesn't spend a lot of time looking at me. (laughs) (laughs) So this is uh, one of the strangest books that I've uh, ever worked on, for sure, and it's been a long time coming. It's an adaptation of E. Hoffman, The Sandman, but of course we can't call it The Sandman for obvious reasons. You know anyone at DC that would let us, John? Probably not, right? I got some, I got some pull, but um, that pull actually goes backwards, so it's <laughs> More of a push, really. So it's, uh, it's exactly uh, found the right home at Heavy Metal because they published some very, um, very interesting, very strange, very esoteric work. So we're really happy to uh, have it out through there. Yeah, issue one is available now through Heavy Metal Direct and uh, be in previews, I believe, real soon. And I have included a link to uh, the eye collector in the description for this video. So go ahead, guys, and uh, click on that link and, uh, and pick up Greg's new book. Uh, now let's get into Candyman. <laughs> um, so, uh, what do you guys like about this movie? It's a 1992 horror movie. Tony Todd, uh, Virginia Madsen. It's one of my favorites, and the three of you had never seen it before. So, um, what did you guys like about it, George? What I liked the best is that I had never seen it before, and I had very low expectations because I thought it was a movie that was going to land like so many of those 90s slasher films right in that plotless gore fest category, which can be fun, but exhausting if you see too many. And this was so different than that. It was chef's kiss. I really enjoyed yeah. the Candyman over To your point, um, it did get that way later in the uh, two and three. It got into the, you know, slash porn kind of thing. But this film is awesome. Right. Why so do you have to spoil the future, John, for me? Like You're God like that guy it. with the candy who's eaten a candy and is immediately thinking about the next candy in the box. I just want to savor Unless this. Unless I have a hook. No, it's not. It's not a good hook. Let's just savor this one. <laughs> well, um, if, uh, if you guys are like me, I love the opening scene. Um, yeah, Gio and I were talking. I called George Gio for those of you who are just tuning in at home. Um, Gio and I were talking about how that opening scene seems kind of like um, the perspective of the bees, but I also saw a lot of Stanley Kubrick in it. You know, there's a beautiful bit every time he went to Virginia Madison's car and he does the, the arcing in uh, obviously a helicopter shot, then they didn't have drones. Uh, it's those are some beautiful bits of uh, filming. Also, they do a lot of location shots, but they build a lot of sets. The bit where she comes out of the mouth of uh, Candyman was badass. I was like super excited about that, the way that they did that. Yeah, so there's so many gr- little juicy moments in this film that I just kept being surprised. I mean, even the introduction, the first time you see Tony Todd's character in the silhouette, got his head tilted back, and he's going, uh, oh. what's the girl's name again? Uh, Helen, right? Helen is so badass. I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And what a great twist. We don't see him till the middle of the movie. I love 44 minutes in. 44 minutes. 
Yeah. It's the Jaws. It's the Spielberg Jaws thing, right? You don't show the villain or the beast until later, right? But you keep you know, getting little flash. Uh, love it. Yeah. What a great way to establish like a new horror villain is to have people researching the villain and and talking about it. So you're kind of you're building up anticipation with the viewer for you know 40 plus minutes waiting for for this guy to show up. And uh, you do see him a little bit in the. Uh, and the baby they do that little flash, and then a little flash, you know, little like, in the mirror. Yeah, it's a little teaser, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like the shark. We saw the fin go by and Jaws. You know, you see yeah. that. You know, yeah. shark. But you don't get to. You know, there's like they show a little bit of the hook. But you know what? I got to be honest with you. Like one of the things that kind of surprised me the most was how clever the dialogue was. You know, they didn't do that exposition to kind of tell you everything. Every time they did an exposition, it was part of the story. They were actually revealing a little bit more of it. I was really impressed with the script. But. It's character, right? They gave the characters a reason for all the exposition to come out naturally because they're researching the freaking monster. They're not it's surprised perfect. by him. It's kind it's of so, perfect. It's so perfect. And I'm a huge nerd for semiotics, how things yeah. acquire meaning and they're given meaning. And so suddenly here's a horror movie all about how a legend becomes a legend, how it gains power by its repetition, how the Candyman himself is a creature that only shows up when the character starts telling people he doesn't exist. When they're proving that he doesn't exist is when he shows up. Yeah. Incredible. Well, and then he goes into that whole long dissertation about how he has these sort of lesions who follow him. And as long as she's saying or anybody's saying he doesn't exist, he has to come out because he's got to keep proving himself back to his legion, which oh. I thought was freaking awesome. Yeah. What a great religious parallel piece to it where he's this person that, you know, if, he believe, if people believe in him, he's real. As soon as people question yeah, him, exactly. He starts to lose that power, and so he has to go for the one person who's fucking up his jam, which is the wonderfully insane Virginia and, Madison, who sells crazy really well in this movie. Virginia Madison, I've always loved her as, a, as an actress. She's just amazing. You look at her sideways. She just brings so much empathy mm -hmm. to, to a character. And uh, which, uh, to your point, Andrew, and to uh, Greg, she sells this film. When the oh, yeah. credits first come up and it says Virginia Madison, then Tony Todd, all I knew was from the, you know, Candyman 2, Candyman 3, so it was always the Tony Todd vehicle. But suddenly I realized this is a Virginia Madison movie. And the director loves her, and he just he moves in on her face, and he sits there, and he just lets her work. And it's so fucking good. I have deep thoughts, though, about something that I found out. So Rose, the director, uh, what's his first name? Um, Bernard. 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 Rose. Uh, Mr. Rose, I'll call him since I don't know. Yeah, he owns it. He owns that. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Rose. Apparently, in order to get those um, performances when the Candyman arrives, he had a hypnotist hypnotize her so that she would get all emotional. And they implanted, apparently, this is the Ellen actress telling this story. I found an interview of her talking about it. Uh, oh, wow. A subliminal word that they could use on set that would trigger these emotional traumas that the hypnotist had implanted. But didn't I you mean, know I, to it and like not want to do it anymore or something? Like, I don't it? know. I'll, I'll I got as far as I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, I read That's that she it scared her a lot. Well, those bits where she does the bit where he's talking to her and there's that sort of weird seduction that's kind of going on at the same time as the horror and she's rolling her eyes back, you know, like she really sells that in such a way. And I, maybe it's the hypnotism or maybe she's actually, you know, truly experiencing it. But I was completely captivated. I saw her in a movie called Gotham a few years back. I don't know if you guys remember that one, but oh, she's, yeah, you know, she plays, yeah, plays that sort of femme fatale kind of character and does it so well. So to me, that was like, you know, that's where I know her, where she does that really nice bit where you're kind of like, oh, this, it's really juicy. But this one, it required so many levels of her to do it. And the beautiful beeline with her husband being this douchebag. Beeline, you know? beeline. I see what you did. It's so good, right? I love that. Under and she my thing. <laughs> you stole your shtick. Sorry, man. Listen, let's just think about it. Just buzz off. <laughs> so Tony Todd is just... Uh, amazing in this movie too and he he did all the scenes with those bees for real too and got stung yeah. a bunch and stuff like that and uh i think he's just absolutely captivating every time he's on screen and the two of them were just terrific together as well yeah well i mean he's worse brother what do you expect right huh? gravitas gravitas is the word and yeah michael yeah. doran's brother the uh yeah. The I didn't know that. That's cool. Wait, is that oh, yeah, yeah, Star Trek? <laughs> Worst brother. Yeah, he's the uh, yeah. Yeah, in Star Trek. You guys, come on. I yeah. thought you were nerds. 
What's going on? Thank John, really thank you for coming and to... raising the nerd cred to a level I'm more comfortable with. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, it, it, he's, he's amazing. He's, he's absolutely amazing. Tony <laughs> Todd is so great. You know, you could think that they're kind of picking him for the voice, but it isn't the voice. He does so much. There's even a little bit where there's this weird seductiveness to his creepiness. That oh, is so yeah. strange. Like when he's dragging the, the claw, the hookupper dress and that sort of thing. And he, But he's just the way he wears his face. He does it in such a ambiguous way that you're not sure if it is and then finally when they reveal that at the end you know the, the the link between him and helen it all plays but at first i was kind of going like oh is this a weird choice from the director to be you know kind of sexualizing this violence but then you go oh wait a second there's a whole thing that goes on here right and that was really really clever well i have questions <laughs> so this is where this is this is if it edges into bad or good to me because the I, I thought it was amazing everything running up to that last 10 minutes i was like holy shit this is i'm so glad you know whoever suggested it we should watch this because it was so solid it got to the end george thank you um and the whole thing where he died in the bonfire like he's this you know supernatural thing and then all of a sudden he gets burned alive in a bonfire so i was like did he what? test his powers but fire is cleansing right if you want to get really tropey here in the supernatural yeah, 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 yeah. right in the in the in the tropes of those urban legends, fiery is that one thing, right? It's like Prometheus gives us fire so that we can have magic to battle the gods and the supernatural creatures. That and a dozen other mythologies. Fire is the one thing we've got on our side. But they yeah, set up 100%. the fire. They set up yeah, the fire with a like, little kid. Also, oh, yeah, oh. also she, her hair goes on fire, which is, you know, the sign of the Holy Spirit, you know, this kind of idea that there's a transfer of power there. That's sort of the way yeah. I think of it. I think like, He's kind of losing everything, and she's taking it all. Hence the reason at the end, he says, Helen, 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 and now she's got the power, right? Yeah, they turned it into a bunch of sequels, but I think this was always originally proposed to just be this kind of singular idea, a bit like The Exorcist, you know, this is this kind of idea. When I saw her hair on fire, I was like, oh, cool, they're kind of doing the idea that she's taking the power now, saves the child as her last sort of uh, effort of good, and now she's this kind of evil being trapped inside. That's what we are yeah, yeah, it's very, very cool. Like, uh, based off of a short story um, from Clive, Clive Barker. Uh, Clive Barker, yeah. Yeah, but it was in, the, uh, in Liverpool in England. And the bonfire made sense because it lined up with Bonfire Night, which is November 5th every year. So it all, they had to kind of rejig the story when they moved it to um, wherever the hell oh, that's it is. Cool. Chicago. It's Chicago. in Chicago, Chicago. But you know, America has a long history of cultural appropriation. So it's fine that they took that and they just use it. <laughs> America. Right on. America. It's, it's all fine. Bonfire Night is a really fucked up tradition in England anyway. You don't re re realize it until you leave England and then you start telling other people about it and people go, wow, that's really strange. Cool. But Clive Barker is uh, he's, he's also has another horror franchise, right? He wrote the, uh, what's it called? Hellraiser. The, the Hellraiser. Hellraiser with Pinhead. You know, it's, it's the grit that makes the pearl in the oyster. A little bit of grit for the pretentious asshole in me uh, to, really, <laughs> to really shine. And the sweets for the sweet reference uh the shakespeare reference to ophelia yeah. putting flowers on hamlet's grave uh and then the uh romeo and juliet sort of uh vibe of the story of the candy man like his history yeah. of like them being yeah. from two worlds him being the, and then him being a very othello style character uh very as, style. like yeah. all that all in there packed in tight i was not expecting to find so much meat on this candy man i also wouldn't have expected the sweets for the sweet to be uh written out in fecal matter but that happened yeah <laughs> like, you know, like, like wow all right that happened so. uh yeah the the director definitely um takes his time with the movie and uh, lets it kind of marinate and and the horror really feels a lot more impactful and it's not like jump scares it's more and, and i like the whole idea of you know is this possibly all just going on in this woman's head everything and and I like to think of it like that too. Like maybe there is no candy man, it's just her going insane. And what we're seeing yeah. is her delusions. I dig that, but I you know he was a little didactic in the way that he kinda of, you know kept having the candy man bust through a window and pull back and do those sort of things. So you didn't just from my point of view, I, I didn't really get the idea that it could be because they could have done a few things, you know, just the long stare, you know, so slow moving, maybe you know, uh sort of wide, uh, wide angle lens, you know, kind of moving on her and realize, oh, maybe this is in her mind. He didn't do a lot of those things, but it's also the time of period, time period where they were actually making that movie. So she has these beautiful little moments where she's looking at the pictures 
and she's seeing all these things and you see him in the picture and you're going, oh, wait a minute, this is, this is actually really happening. So it starts off with that idea. It was always this in her mind and then you start to see it. But what I will say is, much as I didn't really that particularly like Xander Berkeley's portrayal in, in it much as her husband, he really sells it at the end when he realizes that she might actually be the murderer or so he thinks. And that little bit that they do with his face where he's just kind of, like, she's walking to the hospital and then they take her away and he just kind of lets her go away. That was actually uh, pretty powerful stuff because it's the first time when he's really going, yeah, she might be bonkers. This might actually be happening. And this is just her doing it. Okay, uh, let's get into the bad. What did you guys not like about Candyman? The, the husband's acting <coughs> felt very unconvincing. I, I, I found him a real challenge. I love the British guy who was telling her the story about um, Candyman. He was great. I felt that the husband could have could have been cast a little bit better. It's not like he's a bad actor. I've seen him in great things. But I just, I went, you want the, the more smarmy kind of, you know, like he's that, that dude that every uh, young college girl wants to kind of make out with. He didn't seem like that guy to me. Even the, the outfits and the clothing that they put him in, very loose, very, you know, sort of soft on him. I didn't get the, the kind of thing like, you know, all these women would be throwing from no matter how intellectual he is. It just felt, he felt weak to me. It just, his acting. That was, that was my kind of bugger boot. I yeah. loved him. I, I totally disagree. I thought he was perfectly greasy. And, you know, when he's in the classroom and all the students are around him and he's just, he seems right. like he's like his own, own little rock star. I when just, he leans yeah. into that one, oh. Oh, yeah. 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 He kind of brushes her chest and stuff. Oh. Yeah, he was super greasy. Yeah, yeah. Gross. He, he was, but I, again, I think the director was giving him a lot of movement. I don't know this, obviously, I was on the set, but um, I just felt that, like, physically, I didn't necessarily buy him as that guy. I just, I would go, and this girl is this young, hot, you know, chick who's like supposed to be, you know, like they, they're showing her in every kind of outfit they possibly can to kind of show off her body and that. I was going like, what about this guy is so interesting because he's he seems incredibly weak in, in the way he portrays it. And yet he should be intellectually quite strong and just doesn't come off that way. The opening bit with the uh, uh, him in the um, gallery or in the um, uh, classroom. Um, that was pretty strong. That was pretty good. But everything after that, it just felt so forced. I just didn't. I didn't. I just didn't believe him. But you know, we all have our own thing. I think that might be a um, a function of having to balance uh, the Candyman's overt sexuality and his power on screen. You don't want it to be competing, right? He's supposed to be the one right. with that power. Yeah. Um, the one thing I'll say that I it's not really bad because it's based on something I really liked. The scene where they climb through the window into the other apartment out of Candyman's mouth in the mural. I oh. wanted, yeah, I loved it so much. I was like, Oh, there's going to be so much of this. This is so great. I wanted more yeah. of that level of cleverness of the metaphor and the, um, yeah. like the, the real and the dream all sort of mixing together. Like she's literally Alice through the looking glass in that moment. I understand. Over, yeah. Right. And I wanted more of that. And so that's sort of my one disappointment is that there wasn't as much. Uh, and I looked up who it is. It's a uh, shout out to Jane Ann Stewart, who was a production designer on that. Um, I think they should have given her much more uh, free reign to design some of those transitions. There are some great moments where Candyman shows off his powers. But it's weird because they're not as good or powerful visually as her just climbing through that mirror. I wanted to. 100% agree. That. The thing I, it, it was kind of funny um, was they kept cutting to that one shot of the just the eyes of the painting, and they're not really great, you know. <laughs> like, you know, that's that's the the one part that's kind of weak of the painting. They're, the teeth is freaking awesome. You see her come through the thing, I'm like, but those eyes are awful, and they keep going to them. I'm like, why? That's a terrible painting. But you know, whatever. you know what, John? Because you can draw, you see that. <laughs> but people who can't draw are like, hey, those are great. That's pretty I thought cool. the eyes were great. I was like, man, those are nice looking eyes. But I can only draw stick figures, so it makes all the sense in the world. Right now, if you want to see some really cool eyes, uh, go uh, and purchase the eye collector available at Heavy Metal. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. nice um, all right, so my negative um, for the movie, and I think I only really have one, is that it, the pacing is a little slow. I feel like they they kind of they they rest on the shots just a little bit too long, and you know throughout the course of a movie, you know, you just, you take off a few seconds here and there. And I think the whole movie would just be a little bit, a little bit faster. I think it's just, and, and you know, I do like it. It's methodical and it's horrific and it's, and it's a descent into terror, 
and I do like it. And I like this movie very much. But that would be my one negative is that it could have been just a little bit faster, just just a little bit. I understand what you're saying, but I, I sort of feel it's, it harkens back to the Exorcist, the slow boil, or the or Jaws. You know, like he's really trying to kind of make you feel these sort of emotions rather than shock you. You know, look, a cat jumped out of the window, ah, you know, that kind of stuff. So he's taking that sort of slow boil. So I, I know what you're saying. And most of the modern films obviously move a little bit quicker. And then we're sort of seeing a lot of that in, in today's films. But I kind of love the fact that in the 90s, it just took a little bit more time to, to let you digest what's kind of going on. And that, that slow boil on this one kind of yeah, well, this movie is almost 30 years old now. It's, uh, and, and, you know, filmmaking has changed, right? And move, movies move a little bit faster now. And so it's, it could just be my, you know, kind of more modern sensibility of movie watching, you know? But that, a 30 year old horror movie, it holds up pretty good. Like, you yeah. can throw up a lot of 30 year old horror movies that are a piece of shit now. So we're talking about negatives. The scene where Bernadette, or is it Bernadette, the, the friend? I think so. Let's go with that. Yeah, let's go with let's call her B. So uh, B is knocking on the door, and this girl has just been released from prison. She's now been attacked like this, or possibly for killing somebody, and she's knocking on the door going, Hey, it's me. Hey. I go, I don't know if I believe that. I don't think you can do that. That was kind of funny. I was laughing to myself about that. I kind of went it the same way Greg did with Pretty Low Expectations. I really enjoyed it, and I, the pacing didn't bother me because I did kind of like that slow burn, kind of Jaws-esque kind of reveal of the killer at the end. Uh, the motivations bugged me. Her motivations make sense. She was researching for paper. That all made sense, and then she got obsessed. His motivations don't make sense to me because if he wanted to reinstate himself as this power, he never revealed it. He just kept framing her again and again and again, and then the whole switch through. While we can talk about Pirate being the ultimate killer of bad things, it still irritated me. Like I'm like, why the fuck did that guy just die? Like, why did he just burn in that fire? He's built it for himself of windows, appear and float and disappear and vanish, and he burns in a fire like a bitch. If he dies at the end of the film, it's the only way you can end the film. Is he has to be defeated, right? But if you put him in the pyre, it creates, it finishes to me, it finishes that loop of then people will talk about him which okay. will then make him live again but that which was also what he's saying goal. throughout the, the film he keeps saying we'll be written in immortality you know we will so he's saying that i agree with you andrew like as far as the, the choice from the um the director's standpoint to have him burn and you know do the oh yeah okay we burned up the, the demon it was a bit weak it didn't need necessarily to happen but what I did love was her ultimate sacrifice. And again, you know, her, her is crawling through the flames. Her sort of absorbing that thing. He kept kind of, kind of going on to that. And then when they cut to that final thing where he goes, it was always you, Helen. And you realize that Helen is the woman that he was painting in the first place. Mm -hmm. That was fucking badass, man. That was cool. The guy went, holy shit, right? She's the chick. You know, from years ago, I mean, we've seen that trope a little bit, you know, like Dracula pining for uh, Mina Murray because she looks like his dead wife in uh, Francis Ford Coppola's thing. But hey, that was the same year, by the way. Made the same year. Oh wow, interesting. Really? I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Wow, <laughs> different film techniques, eh? All over the place. Like yeah, they obviously yeah. had a budget, but I was really impressed with what the director did on that budget. I was saying that to Gio when we were uh, watching it. We was going like, "This is a freaking fine-looking film for the amount of money he probably made it on." Like it really looks good. It was made for six million dollars. Um, you know, which what? is. Uh, you know, but this is 30 years ago, so that's a that's a medium budget for a horror movie. Uh, all right, let's get into the skinny. Uh, let's give grades for uh, what we thought of Candyman. Um, I'll go first. Um, I'm going to give it an A. I love this movie. This is uh, one of my favorite horror movies. I think it's a uh, it's a modern horror masterpiece. It introduced a, a, a new kind of classic villain and. I, I rewatch it every few years. I, I, I love this one, and I can't wait for uh, uh, the Jordan Peele produced uh, uh, new version to come out. I'm so psyched for it. Yeah, yeah. All right, I give it a B minus. It, it only falls a little short just because the the ending irritated me because I thought it was super solid up until then, and I was like just left kind of confused. And I like when she came back as you know his replacement, but the fire thing is going to continue to irritate me. Yeah, I, get you. I give. I give it two hooks up for sure. Um, <laughs> if if you are like me are aware of the Candyman franchise, the way it bubbled to the surface of public consciousness around Candyman three, and you thought this looks stupid, um, do yourself a favor and watch the first Candyman because wow, I agree. 
I see now why there are so many repetitive sequels because that first one is really something. Yeah. The echoes, yeah. maybe not so much, but that first scream. Woo. And I guess I would uh, I would say probably myself. Um, yeah, I'd give it about an eight. I think Geo's uh, pretty spot on there. Um, it's it's a bit like The Exorcist. You know, you see The Exorcist in, the, in all those films afterwards that never kind of you know kind of raised rose to the occasion. But it was really surprisingly. Um, intelligent film with a really crisp uh, script. It had a director who kind of knew what he wanted to do and wasn't afraid to do the you know the full pullouts or or do the long lens where he could kind of get in on uh, her eyes and, and just let that fill the screen. Cast a, uh, a brilliant actor who also has very expressive eyes, so that you know since that played into such a big part of what he was doing over and over again, it really really played. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a really really strong film and so surprisingly strong because I'd only seen the the, the sequel. Um, I was kind of blown away by how, how good it was, and uh, I thought the time was brilliant. All right, so that's going to do it for another episode of Inside Movies. Um, so if you guys want to follow us, um, I have linked all of our socials, uh, GMB uh, Komichek, Andrew Buckley, John Delaney, myself, George McHale. Uh, all of our socials are, are in the description of this video, so if you want to follow us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or wherever we're at, go ahead and do that. And Greg's book, uh, The Eye Collector uh, from Heavy Metal. Check it out. There's a link in the description. See you next week, guys. Peace.